Welcome back to The Secret of the Golden Flower. Now we're going to get to the actual method, or at least the introduction to the method, and begin to discuss the backward flowing method. The work on the circulation of the light depends entirely on the backward flowing movement, so that the thoughts are gathered together in the place of heavenly consciousness the heavenly heart. So meditation means backward flowing movement. Normally the mind, vision, hearing, smell, taste, touch, and so on are directed outward toward the world, toward sense perception. But in meditation, I want to make a distinction between meditation and concentration, first of all. Concentration is a narrowing of the mind's focus. For example, in the Buddha's teaching, there are eight jhanas. Now the word in Pali, jhana, is derived from the Sanskrit word dhyana, which is also usually translated as meditation. But actual meditation is not a narrowing of the mind, but an opening of the mind, complete opening, and seeing the uh, ultimate reality, the supreme energy in all things, everywhere, unconditionally. This is meditation and it happens spontaneously. There is no such thing as a meditation method because meditation is a natural thing. It's a phenomenon that occurs when you are ready, when you are open for it, when you're clean inside. So when you're clean and innocent, loose and natural, relaxed, deeply aware in all ways, then meditation can happen. That's not saying that it will happen because, again, it's spontaneous. It's natural. There's a Zen saying, I sit here doing nothing and the spring comes and the grass grows all by itself. In other words, the whole point is to get ready for meditation. And then when the season comes, meditation will happen. So most people, of course, are living in the mind and they're very impatient. They want results right away. Uh, so they take up one of these methods of concentration on some object. Now, concentration on an object requires a self, a subject, an object or target, for the meditation, the focus, and the relationship between them, which is called jhana or dhyana, concentration. Meaning, I focus exclusively on that object alone. So, for example, in the first jhana, the object is a consciously directed stream of thoughts about a particular topic. Many of us have experienced this. When we get absorbed in a subject, a favorite piece of music, for example, or art, or maybe a favorite activity, martial arts, roller skating, whatever it might be, doesn't matter. The point is the mind is completely absorbed in it. And this absorption brings pleasure to the mind. The mind enjoys states of concentration. And the more concentrated we are, the more we block out all external stimuli, 
and focus exclusively on the object with one pointed concentration, the more that pleasure grows. So this pleasure is felt in an extreme degree by advanced, I want to say meditators, but it's really concentrators who are in the higher jhanas and non-material jhanas. And I'm not going to get into a discussion on the jhanas. You can go look it up if you want. The point is, concentration is a process of cleansing the mind of all extraneous garbage, leaving pure awareness. And when pure awareness grows, it can become meditation in its season. But it can't be pushed. It can't be forced to happen. Because what has to happen is a backwards movement of energy. See, instead of looking out into the world and focusing on different objects, and they could be subtle as well as gross objects. They could be mental objects also. But that's still going out. <laughs> the mind is not the awareness. The mind is the object of awareness. So I know the confusing terminology here is that we normally think of mind as being part of self, and we identify with the mind. But what is the mind, actually? If we go looking for it, we can't find it. Just like if we go looking for the self, we can't find that either. But what is the mind, actually? It's simply a collection of thoughts. The thoughts that we identify with as mine. So remember, we went through the root sequence before that I is created by mine. First, we identify something as mine. Uh, we conceive of it as mine. It's thus, it's called a conceit. And then when we have identified it as mine, then of course, there has to be an I who owns it. Right? <laughs> but go looking for that I. Try to find that I. Where is it? You can't find it. And the same thing with the mind. If you go looking for the mind, you won't find anything. There are thoughts and thoughts and thoughts, but no mind. Simply the thoughts that we identify with. Uh, we put our stamp of mind on then we think, oh, that's the mind. But actually, thoughts are just sort of drifting through. You know, they're buzzing into the room like, like flies, <laughs> buzzing around our head. And uh, ones that we like or that we don't like, we identify with. The ones we don't care about, eh, just ignore. So that's the mind. And that's the self. But really, these things are simply collections of phenomena that happen to be nearby. <laughs> and we identify with them. So it's really fun to watch, especially if you don't have to do it anymore. You can watch it in others. And there's no need for television. <laughs> there's round-the-clock entertainment. But anyway, what we're getting on here is the backward flowing movement. Instead of projecting, instead of conceiving, instead of identifying, instead of projecting outward, we relax, become loose and natural, not try to do anything special, but allow the energy to flow in. I know, I know, you're gonna, get, you're gonna ask how? Never fails. Okay, so I'll give you a trick. Um, look in the mirror. Look in the mirror or look at a picture of someone. For example, your guru. And when you look at the picture or you look at the image in the mirror, instead of thinking, I am looking at him, think he is looking at me. Allow the energy to flow in. 
Now, if you do this in a state of concentration, with the eyes closed, you will see something called nimitta, the sign. And the sign is a momentary flash of light, blue, white, and sometimes reddish. Just a pinpoint of light that flickers on and off. Now, uh, these aren't hallucinations. They're energy phenomena. And if you are meditating, concentrating your mind, and this happens, don't be scared. It means the energy has begun to turn. You're starting to get the actual result or the actual intention of the technique, which is to reverse the energy. All meditation techniques, authentic ones anyway, simply reverse the energy flow in one or more chakras, one or more senses. You can take any of the 112 techniques, for example, in the Bhairavi Vigyan Tantra, Bhairav Vigyan Tantra, or the Book of Secrets from Osho. Take any of those techniques and analyze them, and you will find they lead to a reversal of the flow of energy in one or more chakras or nodes or nadis or senses or anywhere where there's energy flowing. Anywhere where you can perceive means there's energy flowing, your energy. So as soon as you become cognizant of this energy, turn it around. Don't let it flow out. It's leaking chi. Whenever the senses are directed outwards, we are in the process of dying. Because the chi is going out through the senses. And this is actually the reason why a lot of spiritual people condemn sex. Because sex done in the ordinary way is simply a wastage of energy. Now, that's not true of tantric sex, but that's a whole big topic that I don't want to get into here. Uh, I've done enough work with tantra now. In fact, I'm infamous because of it. But anyway, if you allow the energy to flow inward, huh? Say, for example, that you're a male. And in male sexuality, the energy is very strongly directed outward. Well, what happens if you relax and let the same energy flow inward? It's like similar to female sexuality, isn't it? Yeah. I'll never forget the incident that began my research into this. It was a very surprising thing. I was teaching Tantra in Santa Cruz, California. And back in the early, eight, late 70s, I think it was, a long time ago. And of course, I was teaching in terms of the uh, a typical uh, scriptural background, uh, which I had learned in Kashmir from some Shaivites following the Vigyan Bhairav Tantra. And so the question came up, well, is it possible for gay men to do tantric sex. I had never thought of it. I had never even considered the idea. I was taken aback. I was like, hmm, I don't know. And it took a long time to get around to it. I guess I had a square to it before that. <laughs> but as it turns out, it is possible by reversing the flow. What's the difference between male sexuality and female sexuality? Only the direction of the energy flow. That's all. So a man can feel female sexuality by allowing the energy flow to reverse. Similarly, when we are active, physically active, the energy in the second and third chakras is going out. But when we do a practice like shibari, where the body is restrained, the energy can flow in. We can become receptive, feminine. And of course, the same is true of all the other chakras, the heart, the throat, and especially the agnya chakra, the mind chakra. 
Normally the mind is going, I want this, I want that. Let's go here, let's do that. Then all kinds of desires going outward. This is a wastage of energy. The mind, when relaxed, simply perceives without desire, without having to move out through the senses. The senses are still operating. The same impressions are coming all by themselves. There's no need to go in chasing them in pursuit of some perception or desire. Just relax, let go. And the same perceptions, the same impressions will come without effort. This is reversing the flow. So this backward flowing technique can be applied in so many different ways, in so many different areas. But for our purposes here, the most important application is in the Agnya Chakra. That's why I gave the technique of gazing into the mirror or gazing at a photo. I like to look at a photo of Rajneesh, I mean Osho, and imagine that he's looking at me. Well, a lot of times in, in meditation when it, when it happens, he does come and look at me. <laughs> Just a presence. It's very nice. But this is the connection with Guru. If you have good connection with Guru, then Guru will come. Hmm? Guru will visit you. He will contact you. Not giving any verbal message. That's of the mind. But simply as a presence, as an energy. So allow this. Open the mind. Let the mind become feminine. Let the mind become pliable, open, receptive. It's not going to hurt you, especially if you're in a controlled situation like a meditation room or center or something like that. Just allow. Allow the energy. Relax. Don't do anything. This is called non-doing. It's very difficult for Westerners to, to get this. I'm not going to say understand it, because understanding is also kind of doing. But to let go and just allow things to happen, is very difficult for us Westerners. Why? Because from the very birth, we are programmed to be doers, huh? to be egos, to be selves, to be responsible, to be at cause. And of course, there are some material advantages to that stance. But when it comes to spiritual life, it's an absolute disqualification. I can't recall how many times, I mean, innumerable times, I have seen the so-called spiritual people, and teachers and like that. And what are they doing? They're simply struggling, fighting very hard to stay on top of some social pyramid. They're fighting very hard to get some position in an organization, to get recognition, to get a reputation, to get a name for themselves. Why? That's all they know how to do. They've been trained like that, conditioned like that from birth. And all the more serious conditioning, if they've been successful at it <laughs> and got some rewards like social advancement or career advancement, from being outward, aggressive. But it's actually a form of violence, and especially violence to oneself. Because energy and the mind are like a pendulum. If you push the pendulum very far this way and let it go, it automatically swings to the other side, isn't it? And this is non-doing. I call this the pendulum principle. If you want, for example, to experience non-doing in the second or third chakra, then go for a lo nice long run or walk or swim huh? until you're completely exhausted. And then it feels so good to just lay down. Ah, oh. <laughs> That's non-doing. It feels good, doesn't it? Just let go, relax, let the energy flow backwards. Oh. 
So then he says, the heavenly heart lies between the sun and the moon, the two eyes. The left eye is the sun, the male eye. The right eye is the moon, the female eye. So between the sun and the moon is the heavenly heart, the Agnya Chakra. Agnya means I don't know. <laughs> but because we don't know, we're always trying to know, trying very hard. But this is outward flowing energy and we become exhausted. Then what? Most of us don't know how to relax, don't know how to empty the mind, don't know how to let the energy flow backwards. So what happens? We dream. When we sleep at night, of course, the mind relaxes. And then all this stuff happens in dreams. Well, what is that? It's simply the energy flowing backwards. It has to. Otherwise, the, the mind would become exhausted very quickly. And this has been shown to be true in experiments where people were sleep deprived. After a few days, they start going mad. Why? Because the mind or any other organ cannot sustain an indefinite flow in one direction. It has to relax and allow the energy to come back, just like the tides, just like the waves. Huh? Go to the ocean and look at the waves. They come in, they roll in, they hit the shore, and then the water goes back out. Huh? The tide comes in, the water raises up, and the tide goes out, and it goes down again. This is nature. Cycles of nature are everywhere, including within us. So let the cycle, in fact, even help the cycle go. Allow the energy to reverse. Allow it to flow backwards. And just like relaxing after a long run or hard workout, you'll feel so much pleasure. Well, and this is only the beginning of the backwards flowing technique.